What's going on, everyone? Welcome to a Wednesday edition of Back Your Play with Q. As always, I'm your host, Rich Quinones. Do not forget, check us out on the YouTube channel. Subscribe, like, comment, share all the videos. Appreciate the support at Rich Q on Q. We are always brought to you by our very good friends over Played Against Sports, 1450 Clemens Bridge Road in Deptford, New Jersey. Tell them that when you go in the store and you get the gear, when you're looking to get best dollar, best bang for the buck, the hockey equipment, the soccer equipment, the cleats, the weights, the golf drivers, you name it. Tell them you heard it right here. BYP with Q. You'll get 10% added to when you go in. You actually sell your merchandise, 10% taken off your next order as well. With that, we welcome in our good friend Lloyd Vance, host of Lloyd Vance's Insider Football 1029 The Game down there in Tampa, but he's a Philly product, if you will, in the Delaware Valley and also part of the Broad Street South Network. And uh, we are always thrilled to have him on. We'll start to look ahead to week seven. A quick little rewind, if you will, remix week six, uh, maybe in a minute or so, my friend, just your takeaways from the week that was in the NFL. It was crazy, man. I, I called it Surprise Sunday. It was the, the who saw all these situations coming? You know, the, the Cleveland Browns, we talked about on Friday, you and I, we looked at the lines and everything, and these teams were heavy underdogs at home. And you know, the home teams ended up being uh, 10 and 15 last week, and uh, a couple of them stepped up, particularly Cleveland, uh, which was a total shocker, them knocking the Niners from the ranks of unbeaten. You had the Jets knocking the Eagles from the ranks unbeaten. And, uh, you know, it, it was just one of those weekends where you're like, wow, anything can happen in the National Football League because there's a lot of parity. And then this 1972 Dolphins, we said it all along, they have nothing to worry about. And, and after six weeks, there's no undefeated teams. And, and th these races are getting tighter. So it's fun seeing who's a contender. But also there are a lot of pretenders that are getting ready. They're collapsing for Caleb and and. You know, we'll probably get to them in a minute, too. Yeah, I think you're also going to see from a betting standpoint, you'll look at some of these teams that typically play tight, tough for about a half or so for in live uh, in live uh, game betting. Then all of a sudden, second half, they kind of falter. But teams like Arizona, teams like the Giants, the Giants covered the spread. They had a chance to win that game. Some bad uh, plays down the stretch. Um, you know, a lot of hankies, a lot of flags across the league. It is what it is. But got to start with, so in our backyard, the Eagles – I thought lost a bad game to the Jets. I actually, believe it or not, um, like the Jets in that game when I was doing my predictions um, late in the weekend. I went with the Jets. Uh, I I just thought the defense was going to keep them in the game. Everyone was getting all bent out of shape because they, you know, the Eagles allowed them to score. I mean, when you're the Jets and your offense can't muster any type of uh, or generate any offense of touchdowns. You take the points when you get it. Jalen Hurts did not play particularly well. Uh, line a little shaky. Lane Johnson banged up. A little surprised they moved, made the move for Julio Jones. I guess it's because maybe Devontae Smith is dealing with a hamstring injury. So if that's the case, you want to add a little more depth. But I believe this team is showing some leaks right now and some cracks in the armor. And I didn't like the play calling. I didn't like the way Jalen Hurts played. He's allowed to have a bad game here and there. But defensively, when the Jets came out, it's almost like a blueprint on how to beat the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, you don't want them to beat you over the top. You want to basically collapse and shut down the run a little bit. Quarterback, as I alluded to, made too many mistakes. Very uncharacteristic, some of the mistakes that Jalen Hurts made. You look at this Philadelphia Eagles squad right now. They got games come up against um, Buffalo. Miami, Sunday night, Kansas City, Dallas, you know, it, it's it's not going to get easy now. And they were able to kind of stat pad to get to five and one heading into Sunday night against Miami. I see some things I don't like from this Eagle squad. Was that loss against the Jets just a blimp, a bump in the road, or was it alarming to you? Yeah, I was talking with my guests on Monday about this and, and, it's a situation where I, I think the Eagles, quite frankly, look past the New York Jets. They, they figured, okay, no Sauce Gardner, no D.J. Reed, and, and they didn't have their starting corners, and, and they were like, you know, we can attack them vertically and, and put this game away and, and play Eagle-style football, which is get a big lead and then allow that defensive line to pin their ears back and, and then get some pressure on a quarterback. And then Zach Wilson, you just figured, okay, he's going to make mistakes in this game. 100%. He did not have any interceptions. 
no turnovers, and, and he, he just kept, you know, he's very efficient in this game. And, and Wilson had his catches in it, and you did hit the particular thing on the head, too. Uh, Jalen Hurts did not play well in this game. Actually, last week I gave him the lackey for week six because he had those three interceptions. He, he I, I think he trusts his receivers a little too much. He's throwing the football in the double, triple coverage, and, and he's kind of throwing it up there, figuring that A.J. Brown's going to come down with it. And uh, they forced the pass way too much in this one. You can pin it on Hurts. You can pin it on Sirianni. You know, Brian Johnson, who a lot of people are saying, is he – doing a good enough job at the offense coordinator. You know, there were a lot of mistakes in this game. You talked about the injuries, particularly when they lost Lane Johnson, they were done. And Jack Driscoll, they should not put him out there because he's going to be a deficiency for them. And uh, and then we talked all along about that secondary that's beat up for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, they've allowed 11 touchdown passes, which is like in, they're in the bottom third of the league in terms of pass defense. They're allowing way too many yards. and and Wilson looked comfortable back there. Yes, he was sacked six times. They got pressure on him, but he did a nice job. But uh, you tip your cap to the Jets who go into their bye, but the Eagles, that's a game later on, Q, that they may look at and say, you know what, we could have won this one and, and we needed that W because you talked about that big stretch coming up. Yeah, and listen, I think maybe you can live with a loss at a conference, but four turnovers and they only scored 14 points. You're not going to win many games on a Sunday San Francisco, I think a little blimp. We know with the injuries with McCaffrey and uh, Debo Samuel. Uh, You know, Washington, they play the Giants. I think the Giants actually bounce back this week. And I like the defensive effort uh, I saw. And, you know, everyone looked at that game the other night and Taylor gave them a little juice, a little spark. It was really Saquon Barkley. You know, Taylor played well up until late. And then, of course, the blunder uh, where for some inexplicable reason – you lose three points. You have an opportunity again. You know, you still got to figure out a way um, to get in the end zone. You had those three points, maybe late. You kick a field goal and win it. But the bottom line is that offense has been stagnant. It's been brutal. Don't know if Jones is going to go. I still like them getting three at home against Washington that now all of a sudden you're starting to see their offensive line. So show some, um, um, some chinks in the armory here. And then the Dallas Cowboys, I like the Chargers in that game, even though both coaches have head scratching moves. And it look, we've hammered Dak Prescott, right? He made the plays when he needed to make the plays. And Dallas fans are just funny, man. You get waxed against the 49ers. We don't hear from you. You beat the Chargers, who are so inconsistent that can't close. I think seven losses span it back to last year, three points or less. Now, all of a sudden, people think the Dallas Cowboys are going to be in the M- NFC Championship. Let's just pump the brakes a little bit. So um, out of those teams I just mentioned, and then Detroit Lions, I think the Lions, for my money right now, might be the most complete team playing the best football in the NFC. I'm not necessarily going to say when it's all said and done, even though I pick and represent the NFC, as you know, in the Super Bowl, I'm not going to sit there and say they can go on the road and be Philly and or San Francisco. Yeah, Q, your uh, Super Bowl picks starting to come back around. You know, Cincinnati is is back winning again, and then you have Detroit Lions. But uh, I'll, I'll take them kind of in order the way you laid them out there. The Dallas Cowboys, you know, that was that was a good solid one. I expected them to lose this game. We talked about them limping into it, and and Dak Prescott was efficient, twenty one of thirty, two hundred and seventy two yards, one touchdown. He had no interception, which has been his Achilles heel. And then he ran the football, which we have not seen in quite a while. He had seven rushes for 40 yards, and he had that big touchdown on that read option that kind of broke that game open. So he he was able to find C.D. Lamb in this game, and and then uh, they were able to have Micah Parsons have that big closer for them. So that that uh, sack for them, and and then Stephon Gilmore stepping up in terms of that big interception to shut the door and and. The Chargers, once again, are the Chargers. You know, Brandon Staley, he cannot win these close games. And, and two, the, the clock is ticking on him. I, I think it's a matter of time before the end of the season and then the Chargers kind of move on from him. Uh, I was thinking about you all during that Giants game. It was interesting watch because you think, all right, Terod Taylor, you know, on the road. And uh, it, it's just a tough spot. And, and the Giants were very beat up, as we know, going into that game. Uh, but they gave the Bills all they could handle in this one, and, and uh, their defense stepped up to the challenge. They 
Josh Allen was very frustrated. I know he got to dig all the digs for 10 catches for 100 yards, but uh, the Bills still cannot run the ball with any effectiveness. And, and that's going to be their Achilles heel when they get to the playoffs and, and later on down the road. But a uh, good quality game. And I actually thought with not getting those points at the half, but they had their chance at that last untimed down and, and Waller goes up and gets it. And, and Q, to be honest with you, I thought there was a penalty there. It was. And I, don't have a problem. I, don't have, I don't have a problem with the play call, right? Because the thinking is if Saquon couldn't get a yard before, but Taylor's got to understand in that situation, come on, man, you can't run the football. That's Pee Wee Pop Warner football. You know that. No timeouts, end of the half. Um, it, it's just, it's inexplicable. And they left three on the board. But again, they can't get in the end zone. And Saquon, I give them credit. They stuck to the run and he broke a couple long runs and had about 75 plus in the second half. Uh, offensive line. Justin Pugh with the line of all lines with the introductions, you know, straight off the couch. They sign him. It's still a banged up line. I I just think that defensive effort, if they do that against Washington, uh, I would like to see Jones under center. I know he practiced today, but no contact hasn't been cleared. As opposed to Taylor, I think they can win the game. I still think they can win the game with Taylor if they run the football with Saquon. But you have so many weapons that they're just not getting the ball to. And it's just going to be their bugaboo this year. That's why they're not a good football team. Um, you know, look, we, we, we've we talked about it, right? You mentioned the Chargers. I mean, here's a scenario for you, not to kind of flip-flop, but the Patriots yeah. are bad. I mean, they're in tank yeah, mode. They're going to lose a lot of games. Uh, look, can you foresee a s- scenario where Robert Kraft gives Belichick an out and you're looking at a team in Washington that uh, has a defense and new ownership and the enemy? Uh, maybe you're looking at a team in the Chargers that has a franchise quarterback and has some weapons, right? Even though you probably want to get Belichick out of the AFC and into the NFC. There might be an opportunity where if it just goes south and the hoodie decides, you know, my uh, it's come full circle here. I'm done. I'm going to go on to another team. Those are a couple of uh, scenarios you would think. Q and I, I've been kicking this around as well because, you know, he may leave on his own terms, but it may be him and Robert Kraft having that conversation saying, look, man, it, it's time for us to part ways. Yes, you are very good for this organization, but you're just not going to get those 29 wins that you covet to Ted Shula here because this roster is so devoid. And, and we know he's the general manager there, basically. And he's picked all the players and there's just nothing there. So just build a new and let him go someplace. And, and it will not be a surprise, as you said, another one of these teams, another one of those owners that's desperate to make a splash, whether it's the Chargers. Uh, I'll throw the Bears in there. Um, I'll give you another you team. Washington with Joshua Harris. All these all these situations, they would give Belichick the keys to Kingdom because of his reputation. I mean, you look at what happened with Andy Reid. He left the Eagles in shambles, and then, what was it, he had about four days off, and then the Chiefs brought him right in, and, and – he steps in with a good quarterback and he's ready to roll. So it, let, let's say it's the Bears. The Bears have probably – they're going to have, probably have uh, two top five picks maybe in the first overall pick. So, you know, that that, that situation where he could step right in, uh, hit the ground running, and then start building that roster in his image and then go from there. But, yeah, I definitely see – Q, I, I think at this point the Patriots are are pretty much done and, and they might as well just start and Lee Cunningham and then – Start not tanking, but you know, just start moving, turning the page because that's where they're at right now. So I'll give you one that, uh, and I'll give a uh, credit to the prop who joins me when we do our lines uh, mentioned as a dark horse team. Let's say once again the Dallas Cowboys get bounced. Dak struggles, McCarthy struggles. Um, Jerry Jones went this route with Parcells after Parcells won two. With the Giants, obviously went to the Jets, and then later on with the Cowboys, him, Belichick, same lineage, same tree, same personality. They went to control. Here you go, Jerry. Open up the checkbook. Boom. You got a defense. Maybe you got another year or two with Dak. Um, How about the hoodie? And again, this is pure speculation, but can you envision a scenario where 
Jerry Jones really wants to make a splash. He's not getting any young, younger. He wants that pedigree, right? What does Belichick bring? He's bringing a lot of these in the trophy case, right? So all of a sudden, boom, Jerry Jones opened the checkbook. I'll leave you alone. I like to kind of, you know, hover and troll a little bit on the sidelines, but uh, do what you need to do because I understand your resume and body of work and what you're bringing to the table. And here you go. Boom. Yeah, Q, that would be really interesting because we, we know Mike McCarthy is on a hot seat and, and this team, they got a much needed win. They're four and two. They're behind the Eagles by one game, but I still see the Eagles win in NFC East, and then they probably have to go on a road as a wild card team. And, and we usually know how that goes for Dallas in the playoffs, and it'll be another ugly ending. And I, I think this is McCarthy's third season, and they probably, Jones probably say enough's enough. And he coveted Sean Payton. We know Payton's locked in with the Broncos. And so, yeah, Belichick may make sense, you know, but he would have to give up all that control that he so values. We know he's the general manager of the team and he's got his hands in every decision, but um, he's definitely, that definitely is a team that's going to be in play if, if this season ends the way we think it could. By the way, you mentioned the Broncos and I'm doing it right now. The Broncos are going to win outright against Green Bay at home. Whoa. That's that an line interesting one. That, that line might as well be, listen, I piled on Russ. I piled on Sean Payton, but I've watched Green Bay this year. And again, you've got a young signal caller. They couldn't get out of their own way against um, the, the, the Raiders. Uh, they had mistakes in that game. I don't think Love cracked a buck 70. Detroit dominated them. I give them New Orleans. That was a gutty game, but it was a low-scoring game. Should have beat Atlanta. Had some bad turnovers. He didn't crack a buck sixty in that one. He had the signature game to open up the season. Other than that, he's been pedestrian, um, and I, I just don't like them in this spot. And I think as bad as Denver has been, they still have they still have a defense, you know, like if you're really trying to hang your hat on something, the offense has had some issues this year. We all know that, uh, but I, I just feel as though they're due for a win because they've been so bad over the last several weeks. I mean, Kansas city, they hung in there. They only allowed 19. The jet game, you could have argued they should have won the Miami game. We just burned the tape on that one. They lost late on a goofy play against Washington. I, I mean, they're bad, but maybe they're not as bad as their one in five record states. Well, they've been in every game, and it's going to be interesting which Jordan Love shows up because you talked about him uh, to start very slow in some of those early games, even the ones that he won. And then the last game was a total catastrophe before the bye. He throws all those interceptions and, and just looks like he's not prepared to be a starting quarterback around the NFL. So, this is a loser leaves town match that's, you know, from old pro wrestling days. And it's a situation where uh, Denver, they're going to have to need Patrick Sertain, the second, and the rest yep. of that defense to get some turnovers in this one. I do like uh, Javante Williams. He looks healthy again. He, they have Pugron. Uh, you know, Russ, he's got to cut down on his turnovers as well and, and continue running the football to move the change. But the, the Packers defense is one that, other than Rashawn Gary, you have a lot of no-namers there, and, and uh, they, he could move the football against him. So this is going to be an interesting one. I've been kind of back and forth on this game. Uh, I probably will go with Green Bay, though, in this one, because I just think, as we've talked about all along, I just think this is one of those seasons for um, the Broncos. What could go wrong has gone yeah, wrong, and point. And Peyton and Russ are going to probably uh, break up at the end of the year. But, yeah, that's going to be a fun game to watch. So, definitely, I, I, I'm definitely going to keep my eye on that one. You know, the Bills are laying eight and a half. Um, they're on the road. The Chiefs are home laying five and a half. I mean, that's a good tease opportunity. But typically what happens with those home dogs, five plus or more, it's usually a blowout game. I just bring it up just as – um. Uh, I guess just some bookmarking, if you will, with some of these lines. Um, you know, the Cleveland defense has played better. The Colts have issues now with their quarterback. Now, I'm wondering, too, Richardson, I mean, that's 
is this buyer's remorse now if you're the Indianapolis Colts? Well, you know, we, we talked about all those design runs. He he was top three in design runs. He was taking all those hits. And uh, he, you know, Richardson's a very athletic quarterback, but he, he's got to learn to protect himself out there. And you don't want to have him end up kind of like Andrew Luck was, just very beat up, and, and he's just not going to be able to perform at a high level. So I think he's going to be a good young quarterback, but definitely Shane Steichen's like, oh, man, definitely we should probably have him. Right. Looked right at shoulder. some other uh, people. Yeah. So hopefully he comes back healthy. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Gardner Minshew is not a week in, week out starter. They thought, okay, he can come in and do some things. But last week, he looked very bad. They, th what they need to do is they, they re signed Jonathan Taylor. Uh, he really hasn't done much. I know Zach Moss was out there, but they need to get Jonathan Taylor going and then allow that defense uh, with the Forrest Bunkner and the rest of those guys to get going. I, I, I'm concerned because of the style of play. He takes a lot of hits. He's been hurt on three separate occasions. Banged up. Yeah. He had, now the ACL joint. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, the shoulder joint. He had a concussion. He had an ankle. And then now the uh, shoulder yes. injury, which he just shoulder. had surgery. That, yeah. So, I mean, now you're talking about, all right. Um, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I'm looking at this as, you know, stepping back. They're three and three. I don't know how the hell that happened, but they got right. Cleveland, right? I mean, that's a good coaching job. Cleveland, New Orleans, Carolina, New England. I think Minshew can go out and probably – they can beat Cleveland. Cleveland's got quarterback issues right now. I don't know if Watson's going to be available. New Orleans, okay. Carolina's a bad football team. New England stinks. I mean, this team can arguably be 5-3, and three, and now we're starting to talk our 5-4 and four. Uh, going to Tampa Bay, which could be a winnable game too. That's a hell of a coaching job, knowing that you just lost your rookie quarterback. But the injuries to me, first year, banged up, now out for the season, it's just a little alarming to me. That's all. Yeah, you know, and, and this this team's going to be in the mix because let's not forget the AFC South is very winnable. You know, nobody seems to be running away with it. The Jags are in the lead right now, but even Trevor Lawrence is a little banged up. They're not sure he's going to play this week. And, and and it's pretty wide open. So, you know, if, if they can steal a game here or there, uh, yeah, they could probably win that bad division. And let's not forget, seven teams make the playoffs, and we'll see how it goes from there. And, and that's why a lot of people are asking me now about with the trade deadline coming up, you know, do you think teams will make some bigger trades? But I just don't see it as almost every team still kind of in contention at this point. You know, there's nine teams that are three and three. Yeah, it's a really good point. Trade deadline in another week or so. Uh, Kansas City picked up Hartman from uh, Hartman from the Jets. I mean, that was a four million dollar bus. He goes back to Kansas City. Um, we saw that the Eagles not a trade, but signed Julio Jones just as you know backup. Right. Um, it it almost reminds me when uh, Herman Moore had a cup of coffee with the Giants. Remember that. Yeah, and, and you know the Eagles are famous for this. I, I, the, I think they had Carlos Carson in back in the day. They had Mark Duper uh, finish his career with them. James Law, Mark Bavaro, you know, all these Henry Ellard, right? Yes, Bavaro. Yes, I forgot about Herman that. But you Fryer get these older guys. And, yeah, and, it, and you know maybe they'll they, you know Fryer definitely came there and and had a good end of his career there. But he he actually left there and kept playing. So you know the Eagles are trying to get lightning, but I'll see what they have. We know Julio. In the past, he hasn't been the same guy since he left Atlanta Falcons. But if they can have him run some intermediate routes and, and help move the chains and keep things going, um, I, I think he'll be all right. But the main thing is A.J. Brown cannot be double covered because that, that's been killing the Eagles. By the way, that's a great pull. Me saying Herman Moore, who appeared in one game for the Giants. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I kind of remember them. There's, uh, they're like, they're going to throw the fade to Herman here. Can he get it done? You know, like the old days. And and he did not get up there the way like he used to to get that fade. Well, and they, I think it may have been an interception. They 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 could have used him in that. Well, I guess they couldn't have used him in that playoff game. That that's year they choked against San Francisco. But that's kind of weird. He, you know, one one game, one target. And um, yeah, three yards. So there you have it. Um, uh, so. You know, this Miami game against the Eagles, I know people think Philly's going to bounce back. I know everyone's looking at Miami. And it's a tough spot to go in against the Philadelphia Eagles defensively. I like the Dolphins. I think you can win with Tua. 
And that offense that's averaging about 30 plus, you know, the Eagles are averaging over 450 something odd yards of offense. You know, you would suspect it's going to be a high scoring affair, but do you believe the Dolphins are built to make a deep run in the playoffs? Because typically we've seen historically, there have been a couple, there have been a couple teams and situations where greatest show on turf, right? They were scoring 30, 35, 40, 41. But when they needed to make a play defensively and when they needed to score big time in the Super Bowl, they got it against Tennessee, but they weren't putting up 35 uh, in that game. Point being, come playoff time, and you look at Miami and you look at the running backs that can, can throw out there, it, it just reminds me of the NBA when defenses, you ratchet it up and the game's not as wide open on the floor half court offense here we go now try to score Miami Dolphins if they rely solely or just airing it out constantly and you go up against a team that can really stop the run do you believe they will be in trouble do you believe this team is built as presently constructed offensively to make a deep run in the playoffs so Q, when you look at them, they, they're averaging 37 points a game. And, and everybody's talking about could they set uh, set the record of scoring 700 points in a season. And I, I kind of agree with you. At, at every point in the season, whether it's a championship one or a deep playoff run, a team's got to ball their fist up and have a physical game where they run the football, play good defense, and then protect the football. And, and you know, you wonder, it, can Miami do this? I guess over the next couple of weeks, we'll kind of find out can they go in bad environments? Because they're still playing in the AFC East yeah. and they're going to be playing out weather and conditions. And, and Tua's not going to have that perfect situation like we're either in a dome or it's warm down in Miami where he, he can air it out and, and throw it to his speedsters out there. And, and and teams are going to do that press coverage and then they're going to try to get some pressure on a quarterback. We know that that offensive line with Connor Williams at center, he's a guy that can be kind of uh, beaten and then uh, Teron Armstead's a very good tackle, but he can also be – he's injured at, at, some, at points, and then you can also get around him. So this team, uh, as they're constructed, they're, they're high-flying, but you always kind of see those high-flyer teams. Something happens, as you said. I always think about the 98 Vikings where, where Randy Moss and, and Randall Cunningham and Jake Reed and Carter and yeah. all those guys, and then they lose to the Falcons in a physical game where – Anderson ran the ball down their throat and then they made some timely stops on defense. So, you know, we're going to see how this Dolphins team does, but I definitely think physicality is something you got to watch with them because Fangio, uh, he's trying to clean that defense up, but they still are having some problems there. Yes, they're going to get Ramsey back soon, which will help that secondary, but they're still not getting enough pressure on a cornerback, in my opinion. Well, look what happened when they played Buffalo. So they've got close to 3,000 total yards of offense. Buffalo has right yeah. around 2,200. Um, I mean, look, two was thrown for over 1,800. They got over, I'm sorry, yeah, over 1,000 plus already when you talk about their ground attack. But the Chargers, New England, Denver, the first test Buffalo, they lost by 28. The Giants hung in there. Carolina, they waxed. I, I think we're going to look at Miami come Monday and either say, man, they are legit or you get yeah. physical with them and you shut them down and make them a one dimensional team. They're going to be in trouble because that's what the Philadelphia Eagles, they can do that. They can stack the box. We know about the depth. They can get to the quarterback. That's why Tua gets rid of the ball so fast, you know, so it's going to be interesting. You mentioned the Eagles and their secondary issues against those wide receivers and those speedsters with Miami on the surface. You might look at this game and say, man, it's going to be high scoring. If you're the Philadelphia Eagles, it, I don't believe you want to get in a track meet with Miami. And conversely, if you're Miami, the last thing you want is to have Tua drop back to pass 45 plus times in a game. Like they're going to have to establish a run against a very good run defense. Yeah, and 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 we know Mostert is good on the outside in terms of his big long runs and everything. I don't think a chance playing – but and he's the same way, you know. They, they they guys want to get outside, but you have to have those tough physical runs up the middle of that defense, and, and that's the Eagles' strength in terms of their defensive line. I think they're going to get Jalen Carter back in this game. Uh, they got Jordan Davis in there, and, and uh, 
they are thumpers. And then Kobe Dean is playing as well. It's a linebacker position. They got him back and he's going to be in there as well. So they're going to, as you said, they're going to try to stop the run first. And, and, and then in terms of uh, Hill and, and Waddle, they're going to try to give them a little cushion and try to make sure they're, that they're keeping them in front of them. I, that's the main thing. But I think, can the Eagles get the pressure with Reddick and the rest of those guys on that defensive line? And that'll allow Tua not to feel comfortable back there. How about Detroit five and one taking on Baltimore four and two. Uh, this is a tough game for Detroit. I think Baltimore is going to be able to kind of flex the muscle. They're at home. It's a one o'clock kickoff Buffalo. I'm sorry. Baltimore is laying three. I believe this number will sit and stay at a soft three. We don't have to worry about the hook right now. So we're talking about a home favorite um, laying the field goal. I think this is the game, too. When you look at Detroit, we're going to come in on Monday or Tuesday and say, hey, man, this team's got a little grit and moxie. Now, granted, they're 5-1. and one, They're playing really good football. No one can dispute that. They set the tone for their season, opening up the season on the road against Kansas City on a Thursday night and beating them. So we know they can score. We know they can pass. We know they can run the football. I thought that was a nice win against Tampa Bay because everyone was starting to drink the Tampa Bay Bucks, you know, the creamsicle juice there with Baker, and they held them to six. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the same story against Baltimore, but I'll say this. We praised Detroit's offense. We crushed their defense. They've actually – their defense is not bad. I mean, they've – they they held um, um, uh, Kansas City to 20. Atlanta to six, Tampa Bay to six, and then they wax Carolina, uh, who had a couple late touchdowns to get to 24, but they also scored 42. So uh, what's your thoughts on this game? Yeah, Q, this is a prove it game. And, and, and you know, Detroit, they, they've had, they've had some, uh, a couple of opponents that they, they should have beaten, they did, and, and they've been taking care of business. Now, the key thing with Detroit is their health. Uh, especially at the running back position. I don't think Montgomery's going to play in this game. You know, Craig Reynolds may have to carry the rock for them, and, and we'll see how he does. But they have that very big offensive line in front of him, and, and they'll try to go play action with them. And they have Williams back now. He hit that big play down the field against Tampa Bay. He's a real speedster. And if they can get him for some big plays. Uh, the Ravens are interesting because they went over London, which is a kind of get-right game. Still too many field goals, in my opinion, but – that defense is very good. They're number one in scoring defense. They're, they're stopping teams. So if they can get pressure on golf, which I think they will, I think the Ravens will win this one. And, and, and Lamar Jackson still needs some help from those receivers, particularly Odell Beckham. Zay Flowers was playing very well in, in his rookie season, though. Yeah, I, I like this game. I like this matchup. Uh, I'm, I, I don't think I'm going to bet this game. I mean, I'm looking at um, the Colts game. And believe it or not, even with a backup, I like the Colts. I already told you I like Denver. I like the Giants. I mean, I might kind of parlay those three and then maybe throw another team in there. I'm steering clear of the Chargers. I'm probably going to steer clear of the Dolphins. You know, even that 49ers game, right? I mean, again, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Uh, Purdy did not play well. The Niners did not play well, whether they overlooked Cleveland. You know, it's brutal to lose on a missed field goal or a made field goal. But I think we underestimated the Browns defense. And I think that's a blimp for the 49ers. Now, if you don't have McCafferty, if you don't have Samuel, those are two major important offensive cogs to that offense. And more, more or less, you know, that safety blanket for, for Purdy. Um, if they lose this game and he looks bad, now we're starting to say, okay, maybe we jumped the gun a little bit with San Francisco. Seven, a little too high for me. I might tease it down and bookend it with another game, but they should beat Minnesota. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I, I think they're going to um, want to prove that they're still a number one team in the National Football League. They, they had a very big game in Cleveland. They, they, we talk about P.J. Walker beating them, and, and, and they really beat themselves. The Niners had three. Uh, 13 penalties and and you know Purdy as you said had a very bad game he didn't even complete 50 percent of his passes and I think the injuries hurt him so we'll see if Trent Williams is able to play he had an ankle issue 
uh, when he went out of the game, th that definitely kind of turned it. But I think Purdy will be able to get the football out of his hands. I'm hearing McCaffrey may even try to play in this one, given that it's Monday night and its situation may have a little bit more time to have some rest. So I, I think Shanahan will want to get that bad taste out of his mouth. And, and that defense is so good. I, I I think the Vikings are right for the picking in terms of, you know, Kirk Cousins, once you get some pressure on him, uh, he'll make some mistakes. And, and we know – Madison has not played well for them and no Jefferson in this one. So you gave Hertz the lackey who got a game ball last week. I gave it to two of the, you know, two of was just, I, I know it was against Carolina, but once again, he, he's just pinpointing and, and he's just getting the football down the field and, uh, to rekill. Uh, to rekill is just so explosive. That's going to be a really interesting matchup with that one. Like you said, I I probably wouldn't bet that one uh, them against the Eagles, but it's definitely a game we want to watch. And and two quality teams out there with two offenses that can put up some points. And how about uh the commish sitting in office uh, for another two years? You know, I love Commissioner Roger Goodell. His contract will run through twenty twenty seven. So the NFL's compensation committee updated team ownership at. Uh, Wednesday's league meeting to inform everyone of the agreement. So here we go. Um, served in the position since 2006. Love him, loathe him, hate him. He's done one thing. He's made the owners even more rich than they already right. are. And that's why Q, they, they, he's their mouthpiece. He's their guy. He goes out front. He takes the bullets. Yes. He's getting over $50 million a year, I think in salary and then, you know, he's doing his job. They're very happy with him. He's growing the game. NFL, I know the numbers are are almost at an all-time high, and then they're playing games in over in England. They're going to Germany for two more games, and, and the, the game is just extremely popular. And, you know, kudos to him. He does a great job. But I, I, you know, I always cringe, though, too, on draft night when these guys are hugging all over him. No, no. Do you Don't know what – um, or can you guesstimate what Roger Goodell's career earnings are? I think it may be almost two hundred million dollars. Times that by three. Oh my goodness, it's crazy! It's you know, Pete Rozelle somewhere is saying, <laughs> "Rolling, no, man, rolling, could not get rolling. that in. He grew the game more than anybody. You know, he talked about what a great commissioner he was, and and." And then everybody talks about how bad Tag Lebu was. But, you know, Goodell has done a good job oh. in terms of, of just partnering. But, but I also think you get help from Jacksonville's billionaire owner to expand to London and, 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 and expand, you know, Germany and London, those games. And you mentioned Roselle. Without him, there's no there's no merger. History always say that Roselle will be always remember as is the greatest commissioner in, in NFL history, in my Six, opinion. So 600, 600. And, and Goodell's done a great job with as the caretaker of the game. He, he made sure there was peace in terms of labor agreement a couple of years ago and, and the getting the TV contracts. But as you said, he is firmly on the side of management and, and he would all, he'll always make sure he does what Kraft wants him to do. And Jerry Jones and all those other powerful owners. Yeah. And look here, it's all about money, right? So he's, would you say he's arguably the most famous, not impactful, but the most famous commissioner in NFL history? I mean, how can you not? That's interesting. I mean, yes, I, I probably say at this point in terms of the age of social media and, and the number of TV sets and everything and that, but uh, Pete Rozelle was just such an icon. You always just remember that big, the merger, he brought the AFL and the NFL together. Changed the game. And then, and then he, change everything in terms of TV contracts and, and Monday night football and, and all the innovations that he was part of. So, you know, I, I'm always going to say a Roselle guy and, and uh, he, he did a good thing partnering with Archell when he did, he, they always seem to get along with the NFL PA. Yeah. There was a couple of hiccups here in there, 82 and 87, there was a strike, but uh, that's also what Goodell has done very well. He's made sure the product has been out there and then, you know, there's been some innovations in the game. I also think he likes scoring a little too much. They favor the offenses way too much. Uh, um, you know, one of the other things coming out of me and Q is, is they're talking about outlawing this hip tackle or whatever, you know, and, and what are these guys going to do? You know, you get a DB who's trying to take down, let's say, a big old tight end or something. How is he supposed to tackle? 
Look, look, look at some of the roughing the passer calls. I mean, the Giants game oh, was, awful this was week. ridiculous. Awful. Like, I understand player safety, but the sport is a violent, vicious sport. And you mentioned Roselle, and I agree. If you're talking about AFL, NFL World Championship game, hello, that's the friggin' Super Bowl, right? The mer- so yes. without it, you 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 think about the Super Bowl just being like a cute little game back in the day. And then the jets and the Colts and super bowl three and Namath with the upset and 16 to seven. And here you go. And then 10 years later, 15 years. Now it is a spectacle, right? It is a spectacle. The one issue I've always had, and I maintain with Goodell and I understand the company, man, because you're not going to piss where you're eating. We know that. Um, and nor should you in that regard, especially when you're making $50 million a year, you know, Five bucks, fifty thousand, five thousand. Maybe you're pissing a little bit where you eat, but be that as it may, which is still a lot of money. Uh, be that as it may, they for so many years would turn a blind eye to the fact that they were already in bed with sports betting and gambling. Once you open up the door to move a team to Vegas, you know you have to, and and I hate to say it like this. You can't be a little pregnant. So you just can't. So the last time I checked, either you are or you aren't, right? What is it, turn pink or blue? I, I don't know. You know, you guys have to educate me on that. You family guys have to educate me. You married men there. But the last time I checked from the commercial, it's either the plus or the minus. So the point being, Goodell can sit there and go like this all they want. But I think. And he's kind of already admitted, yeah, we are in bed, but it took so long. And you realize how much money is being spent and gambled on sports betting. It's like, just admit it, man. Like, stop trying to hide it. And I also don't like how they handle certain players when it comes to certain suspensions. I I just, it rubs me the wrong way. And uh, it's almost like you're picking and choosing, kind of like what they do in the off season when they're trying to fix some of these rules, it's like, let's just pick and choose who are these rules going to benefit more. And to your point, they want the offenses. It attracts the eyeballs. It attracts the fantasy geeks and it attracts the betters as well. So that's my only kind of soapbox. uh, Yeah. And and you know, with gambling too, you knew they had to do it. They wanted that money. They knew that the gambling and fantasy football that that was something that they they said oh we don't want to be part of but then they started seeing the numbers coming in the door you know what i mean and 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 then they're partnering with everybody you know the nfl is all about partnerships corporate and and all that and that's what the super bowl is all about it's all you know corporate people going to the super bowl and and paying them back at the end of the season and and you know he's definitely on the side of let's keep the revenue streams going And, and now they're to they're going to all the streaming, you know what I mean? Prime and, and Peacock, and they're putting the games all over the place so they get more eyeballs on it, get more advertising. And th- I'm with you, though. In terms sometimes the discipline, uh, I thought it was good that they kind of said they're going to use a arbitrator at this point because I remember Dorn, he was like, hang him high, Roger, at a certain point. He was deciding on the fate of everybody, and then he was backing up on stuff after giving an indefinite suspension and a lot of stuff. Yeah, and the other thing is, um, I still maintain that eventually these games are going to, and I've said it for years. So forgive me, everyone, uh, the BYP audience, um, for repeating myself. I still believe the games are going to be a la carte. There's going to be a time where you just. Yeah, and, and it, yeah. yeah, well, well, their deal with YouTube TV, you know. With the, you can all the out of market games and and they're pushing it hard. You can watch any game out of market now. They they got away from the dish, which a lot yeah. of people didn't like. So, yeah, they're going to have more eyeballs and and they're having fans all over. You know, a well, Pittsburgh a fan, it's an animal. Yeah, Pittsburgh fan wherever can watch the Steelers every week. Yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, don't forget give Lloyd a follow at Lloyd Vance and again host of Lloyd Vance's Insider Football and Broad Street South Pod, and of course, part of 1029 The Game down there in Tampa, and former ESPN NFL Network contributor and Black College Football Hall of Fame Selection Committee. He was down there a couple months ago in Hotlanta 
for the uh, ceremony and uh, came back with some really good content and good stuff as well and some good insight and always kind enough to join us during the week on BYP with Vance's View. All right, my friend, enjoy the games this weekend and uh, we will uh, recap everything. Always look forward to uh, talking a little more football with you as the calendar gets ready to turn to November. Oh my goodness. And it's already starting to get chilly. So it means it's a little hot toddy weather. The Giants are going to be eliminated by Halloween. So I'll be good to go. <laughs> I don't, you know, maybe Dave will pull a surprise on you, but I don't think so. We'll see. <laughs> we got another 10 games to the friggin' season. I don't think so. <laughs> so, all right, brother. Always appreciate you. All right, Q. Thanks for having me on.